Dr. Davis, telephone, please. Dr. Davis, telephone, please. A hundred miles northwest of Birmingham sits the town of Russellville, Alabama. That's where Terrell Potter is sitting in his doctor's examining room. The air conditioning is a pleasant relief from the August heat, and the paper sheet crinkles underneath him as he shifts his weight back and forth. He's a cop, the kind of guy used to helping other people, not waiting around for someone to help him. The doctor returns, his eyes glued to a clipboard he's holding with both hands. Terrell doesn't like the look on his doctor's face, the way he isn't making eye contact, the way his lips are pressed together, determined not to make an expression that would give away what he's thinking. But in doing so, tells Terrell everything he needs to know. He said my uh, kidney function was rapidly decreasing. It had dropped some uh, earlier on, but then all of a sudden it just kind of started going downhill in a hurry. And he said, uh, you know, we're going to have to do something. That something is dialysis. It means using a machine to do the work that your failing kidneys can't, cleaning toxins out of your blood. It changes your life completely. You go to a a center, which the closest one I would have would be like 15 miles away, uh, three days a week for about three and a half to four hours. It limits where you can go or what you can do. Your quality of life is just really uh, drastically changed. People can live on dialysis for years, but Terrell isn't one of those people. Just three months after his initial diagnosis, his doctor has more bad news. My kidney started failing, and at that point, then uh, my health started going down, and I actually found out that I was going to have to have a transplant. Terrell needs a new kidney, but there aren't many available. Well, he told me that it would take Uh, up to a year to get a transplant, to get a a, a kidney. That's time Terrell doesn't have. If he doesn't find a donor soon, he'll die. I'm Tora Kutcher, and this is Tell Me What Happened, true stories of people helping people, an original podcast by OnStar. It's a series of stories about how and why people help each other, sometimes even a complete stranger. October turns to November, and Terrell Potter's health continues to decline. It's not just his body. The disease is also chipping away at his self-esteem. For the first time in his life, he feels needy and vulnerable. I served 44 years in law enforcement, and I'm pretty well an outgoing person. You know, I meet people well. I enjoy folks. I enjoy talking to people and just uh, uh, helping people. That's how I got into law enforcement was uh, I just had a desire to want to help other people. He's had to quit the force. He's too sick to walk a beat. And now he's tethered to machines daily. So we actually done the dialysis Uh, in the house here uh, four times a day. It takes about an hour and a half to do a treatment. You know, I was used to going and and, and doing what I needed to do and and being out in the public and everything, and it was just a real hard uh, setback, you know, when you get to a point where you're no longer able to do that. His hopes for a better life rest on finding a donor. But that's hard, not just finding someone that's willing, but someone who's also biologically compatible. The statistics for anyone living with kidney failure are frightening. Right now, there are more than 100,000 people in the U.S. waiting for a transplant. Last year, only 23,000 people got one. The doctors tell Terrell the wait could be years. I just didn't believe that was going to be the case with me. I felt the whole time like it would not take that long to get a kidney. He's optimistic, but he's also not someone who's going to go begging for help. The doctors tell him that other people in need of an organ have bought billboards on the highway or generated massive social media campaigns. Terrell, he doesn't even have a Twitter handle. Just before Thanksgiving, Terrell's daughter April, with his reluctant blessing, posts a desperate plea on Facebook. She's hoping that someone, anyone, can help her father. She worked in Nashville and was involved in social media a lot. She'd done a lot of 
she was a booking agent for several different groups. So she was really well versed in how to get on social media and do those things. Over the holidays, that request for a kidney sits online. It bounces around the social media universe between photos of families eating turkey and playing football in the backyard. But instead of getting lost in the shuffle, it gets amplified. I mean, immediately, it just, uh, it took off. I had people contacting me from different states and uh, wanting to know how they could help or what they could do and things. So it's just an immediate response to it. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. We had over 800 shares on it. I mean, there was people on there that I had no clue and don't really know how they got the tie to even contact my daughter. Terrell was overwhelmed by the response. Especially as a police officer, you don't think you've made that many friends. I've had a lot of contacts in the community and, you know, relatives and things like that. But I had people contacting me I didn't even know. It's a wave of attention, well wishes and prayers. But Thanksgiving comes and goes, and all that goodwill hasn't produced a suitable donor. Terrell keeps getting sicker. Well, it was right before Christmas, and I told my, you know, just jokingly telling my family and everything, I said, what I want for Christmas is a kidney. If You know, if y'all can get me a kidney for Christmas, that'd be great. I've got a teenage stepdaughter who uses social media a lot. I've told her a hundred times, you need to be careful. Once things get posted, you lose control of them. They can get shared, then reposted. They end up in the hands of complete strangers, and they stay online forever. Usually that's a cautionary tale, but for Terrell, it's a blessing. You see, even though he doesn't know it, his daughter's post is still out there circulating. And one day, it pops up in the feed of a woman named Jocelyn James Edmonds. I was so tired that night that I honestly came in and just laid on my bed. And I thought if I scrolled through Facebook, that would make it better. And I just started scrolling through Facebook, and I seen a, a post. She was just reaching out to, to the world, honestly, begging for someone to, you know, to be tested because her father was in kidney failure and he was not going to live if he didn't get a kidney. Of course, I was like, I don't have time to give him a kidney. I know I'm a nice person, God, and I've got a huge heart, but I really don't have time for anything else in my life right now. And so I just threw my phone down on the bed that night and actually just went to sleep. And that's the reality of organ donation. We all understand how important it is. And I think most people are aware that we have two kidneys and you can give one away and still live a healthy, normal life. But still, giving up an organ to a stranger... That's a big ask. This is Tell Me What Happened, an original podcast by OnStar. And in every episode, we share a story of someone who was saved by a stranger. And I know you're thinking, I can see where today's story is going. Some stranger is going to give Terrell a kidney, and yeah, that's kind of what happens. But there's a twist. I've been arrested 15 times. Well, I'm actually in recovery um, from drug addiction, and I'm a 16-time felon. That's Jocelyn, the woman that came home from work, read the post, but figured she had too much else on her plate. For starters, she's a single mom with two kids. And she's got a history. Fifteen years ago, she had cancer. She had a series of operations, and while recovering from those, got hooked on prescription opioids. To support her habit, she turned to petty crime. And from there, her life spiraled out of control. She was added to the county's most wanted list, and the local news ran a story about her. When I seen my picture come across the TV screen, um, I was just sick. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I knew I had to do something, and I had to turn myself in. Jocelyn served six months in jail. She gets into rehab, and it changes her life. She comes out with a new focus. Her life is no longer about taking drugs. It's about giving back. I have a nonprofit, and we we help women get into treatment. We're in the process of building a rehab for women, and that's just my heart. Like I, I have a servant's heart, and I want to serve and do all I can all the time because I just want to give back. 
Maybe that's why Jocelyn couldn't just forget about the plea she had read on Facebook. I mean, thousands of people had seen the post, felt bad for a moment, and then gotten on with their day. But not Jocelyn. In fact, a week later, she was still thinking about it. And during a Friday evening church service, where they were teaching the book of Leviticus, she heard the phrase, love thy neighbor. And I knew then that I was supposed to give him my kidney. Her decision is firm. She wants to make the donation. But with a situation like this, willingness isn't always enough. The doctors have to make sure that Jocelyn is a biological match. They have to do lots and lots of tests on you. Many, 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 many vials of blood. I think like 70-something to be exact. And lots of time off work. You have to see a psychiatrist. And during these tests, Jocelyn keeps it a secret. I didn't tell anyone that I was doing this. It wasn't for anyone to know. She doesn't even reply to the post. She doesn't want to get their hopes up in case she's not a match. But in her heart, she's confident she will be. Like, I never had any doubt or I never had any, um, anything in my spirit tell me that I, I wasn't supposed to go through this. I was never nervous. I was never nervous. Like, It almost made me think that I was trying to save my child's life, like I was so excited about it. Jocelyn does have one worry. Did years of drug use damage her body? Could her addiction have destroyed the kidney Terrell needs to survive? It's a cold morning in early December. Jocelyn sits at her kitchen table, her hands around the day's first cup of coffee, and then... I was considered a perfect match on December 5th. Jocelyn's ready, willing, and now able to donate her kidney to Terrell. She reaches out to his daughter, April, explains what she's been doing, and gives her the incredible news. Terrell's holiday wish has come true three weeks early. And so April called me one day and said, "Uh, Dad, I have your kidney. I have your Christmas present. I have your kidney. And uh, I thought she was just joking. And she said, I'm serious. She then told me that uh, someone wanted to donate me a kidney. Terrell's kidney function was down to 6%. He was on dialysis constantly. This was almost certainly going to be his last Christmas. That all changed. So what do you say to someone who's just offered to save your life? I guess for starters, you'd want to do it face-to-face. And luckily, Terrell and Jocelyn both lived in the same county, a five-minute drive apart. Terrell isn't very mobile, so Jocelyn came to him. Well, uh, she come over to the house, and uh, I remembered her. uh, It was probably seven or eight years ago when I was working as a police officer. Terrell actually um, was a police officer who arrested me on three different occasions. He was running crazy and doing drugs and stealing and just uh, whatever she could to get by. And so I'd actually put her in jail. He is a very kind and compassionate man. He was always, you know, very professional and very compassionate. It's a reunion like no other. I I honestly had, had not seen Turl since the day he arrested me until the day I walked into his home. That revelation, that they aren't strangers, that they share this complicated, messy past, puts Jocelyn's offer in a whole new context. And I asked her, I said, "Uh, Jocelyn, are you sure this is what you want to do? And she said, no doubt. She said, I'm not going to back out. I'm definitely, uh, I've got your kidney. It was kind of a, a shock, you know, that someone would be that strong and that firm. But I believed her. I mean, it was, it was very... Uh, convincing to me that, yes, this is what she's going to do. It just made me uh, feel uh, a lot of gratitude to her to even think about doing it. Jocelyn understood that years ago, when Terrell was locking her up, he was actually just trying to help her. It's just kind of my nature, you know, to try to encourage people and to help them. And so I would tell her, you know, things like, you need to quit this crazy stuff and, and straighten your life up. You know, you've got kids and everything. You just need to get, you know, get your life together. You know, you're going nowhere the way you're going. She did straighten up her life. And now she had the opportunity to save the person 
who had saved her. Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville looks like almost any other modern hospital. Overhead fluorescent lights, clean, wide corridors. But today, something extraordinary is happening here. I actually met Jocelyn and uh, her uh, future husband at the hospital the morning of the uh, transplant. We met downstairs for a few minutes. Uh, They took her on up to prepare her uh, probably an hour and a half before they did me. Removing and then inserting a kidney is a six-hour procedure. Thankfully, everything goes smoothly. I mean, I immediately felt different. When uh, when I got to the room and come to, uh, the toxins and things was already being uh, taken out of my body. That kidney was functioning immediately. Uh, The doctor said as soon as he removed it from her, and attached it to me, it immediately started functioning. And it done a, a great job, I might add, too. Over the next week, as they recovered, they grew even closer. Oh, yeah, we walked to each other's room every day. I mean, the recovery for both of us was amazing. And those visits haven't stopped. He lives like two miles from me. It's nothing for me just to walk in over there. I don't have to knock on the door. I just walk in, get something to drink hug on, lay on the couch. We talk almost every day. I talked to her last night. You know, it's just a like part of the family. The moral of the story? Well, that sometimes the help you need comes from the most unlikely person. This is Tell Me What Happened, an original podcast by OnStar. And on every episode, I like to wrap up the show by making a human connection of my own talking to an expert about making the world a little safer every day. Because, you know, that's what OnStar is all about. In this episode, I want to talk to Naomi Grant. She's an associate professor of psychology at Mount Royal University in Calgary. She teaches social psychology. That's the social influence and persuasion. And I want to ask her, what kind of people help strangers? Well, I think we're all motivated to help strangers to some extent. You could almost think of it as we have this motivation to be liked by other people and follow social norms. And there is a general social norm that if somebody needs help, sort of the right thing to do is, if, we, if we're able to, to help them. When we start talking about things like this, extreme forms of help, you're giving up an organ to what at the time was thought to be a stranger. Is that something we're already pre-programmed to do just to be part of the fabric of society? Well, I think that with something that's very costly to oneself, like giving an organ, that that involves a a huge cost to oneself. Um, That is sort of a more extreme example of altruism. And some researchers have actually looked to see if there is some sort of altruistic personality. And there, there is some evidence to suggest that some people just have this sort of tendency to give to others in lots of different settings. And perhaps that's even genetically inherited. So you say genetic, and in what way? If you think back to sort of caveman times, the people who are going to survive are people who are included in the group and well-liked by others. And so one way we can achieve that goal of being liked by others is, is by following those social norms around, around helping. I do see, though, personality-wise and, and motivation-wise, that there's a difference between picking up groceries for a neighbor or you know helping pu- do that extra hauling the kill in if you're a caveman. And now all of a sudden donating an organ. They're both definitely acts of kindness, yeah. but one requires this big commitment. So how would you separate those two from analyzing them psychologically? Categorically, I don't think they're different. I think they're just sort of on a continuum. One is just more costly than another. And so that's what I think differentiates the two is just that one is more of a cost to oneself. And so, you know, some researchers have been interested to find out, well, when are people likely to engage in acts that are very costly to themselves. And it seems that one of the key factors is empathy. So the ability to put yourself in another person's position, to really feel the feelings that they're experiencing, to walk a mile in their shoes, so to speak. And so there's research that shows when we feel empathy for someone, um, we're able to kind of help just out of the goodness of our hearts. But then when we don't feel empathy, that's when we're going to weigh the costs and benefits. And will likely only help if the the benefits outweigh the costs. Is the, there a benefit to the donor? Absolutely, there's a benefit to the donor. There's 
always benefits to helping others. There's benefits to to our mood. We're going to feel more positively if we help other people. We can increase feelings of our own self-worth, right? If I can help someone in this, in this way. Um, even it's a benefit because seeing someone else in distress is going to make me feel negative as well. So if I can help that person, it relieves some of my distress by helping others. So there's always, you really can't think of any situation where there's not a benefit to oneself when you help someone else. Do you think that Jocelyn, the donor, part of the story is that she really did turn her life around. Do you think there's a certain degree of that empathy or that ability to be a donor inherent in everyone? And sometimes it just takes another perspective to kind of bring it out in us? Yeah, I do think the potential is there for anyone to do something like that. But I do think you would have to stay open-minded to kind of entertain that possibility. But I don't see why any one of us couldn't do something as as sort of noble and, and dramatic as that. Um, if you'd stay open to it, I think that, yeah, anyone could have the potential to do it if they're able. Well, Naomi, thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. That's it for this episode of Tell Me What Happened, brought to you by OnStar. This series is all about people helping people, just like how OnStar empowers people to get out there safely. Over the past 25 years, they've collected a lot of incredible stories of people helping people. You can check those out at OnStar.com. And while you're there, maybe you have a saved by a stranger story. If you do, share it with us. We'd love to hear your experiences. And in the show notes on your podcast app, you can find more about Terrell and Jocelyn and how they've been doing recently. Please share the podcast with your friends so they can enjoy these good news stories as well. And you can follow us on whatever app you're using so you'll know when the next episode is released. I'm Tora Kutcher, and as always, be safe out there.